Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's uh, talk. That is Future Earth Global Secretariat Hub for South Asia Series 7 Science Awareness Talk. Uh, it's on eco friendly agro technology and field research. So, myself, Dilip Naidu, so I'm a research associate at the Divecha Center for Climate Change. So, I'll be the moderator of the session. So, there's a small change in terms of how the event is happening. So, our first speaker was supposed to be Madhukar Swayambu, but Due to some technical issues, he's trying to join, so we might have a stop later. But uh, we will first start off with the second speaker, that's Dr. Rohini Matu. She's a researcher at the Divecha Center for Climate Change. Uh, Dr. Rohini obtained her MSc degree from uh, uh, University of Baroda, Baroda, Gujarat, where her research work included unraveling the microbial diversity of aquatic environment, which is mostly concentrated on the Arabian Sea and a lake in Vadodara. She then earned a PhD at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. For a postdoctoral mm -hmm. training at Johns Hopkins, uh, she established fundamental tools and foundations in the field of tuberculosis research and also characterized a novel cell way enzyme from the emerging opportunistic pathogen. At the Divecha Center, uh, her, her research focuses on climate change biology, microbiome, soil rhizosphere, and sustainable agroecosystems. Today, she'll be speaking to us about how to increase crop yields without synthetic fertilizer. So I think Rohini can share the screen and maybe start off. Rohini, can you hear the? Uh, uh, can you hear Dilip? He's been speaking, and we have all heard him. Uh, he just mentioned that uh, you'll be speaking now. Uh, can you start the presentation? Uh, is there some issue at her end? Can we just contact her? Yeah, I'll ask her. Yeah, what's happening? Oh, uh, but then uh, I'm able to see everyone here and uh, not speaking yes can you can you hear no 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 we are not muted we are both uh, we are not muted and we are both not muted rohini rohini it's showing that you are muted it is showing that you are muted rohini hello yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Now. But I can't hear you. We can hear you, uh, Rohini. Please start. Please start the presentation. I think we can hear you, so that should be enough. We just introduced you, and you can just start. I can't hear you at all on Teams. Can you just confirm from someone that others are able to hear as well, or is it just two of us? I mean, uh, should... Okay, let me, I think it's the laptop. This is the departmental the laptop. Least... Let me just give me two minutes of change. At least uh... can hear too. Hmm? They are able to hear. The attendees are able to hear you.
Yeah, tell me. Okay, just start the med uh, start uh, just start speaking. It's fine. We can hear you. So you just start speaking. It's fine. Okay, fine. Uh, no, uh, that first speaker is not attending. He's, he's Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll talk. Yes, we can hear. The, uh, the talk through the. Uh, uh, sure. But it's just that I can't hear you on Teams. Oh, I think he has uh, cut the call, but you can start. Yeah. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how to increase crop yields without synthetic fertilizer. If we look at the global production of primary crops, there is a increasing trend and uh, the results show that there has been a, a 54 percent increase in the primary crop production between the years 2000 and 2021 and uh, there has been a record uh, production of 9.5 billion tons surprisingly while there are different and a multitude of crops that are cultivated and harvested around the world sugarcane uh, maize, rice, paddy, uh, wheat, oil, palm, fruit, and potatoes top the list in terms of production during 2021. And if crop produ production continues to increase, we would be heading to a food sufficient world. So what has India achieved in terms of agricultural productivity? There, like you can see here, there is a positive trend in production consistently increasing from 2021 to 23, surpassing the five-year average. This data indicates a robust and growing agricultural output in the major food crops in India. And we are also a major producer of bovine milk in the world. In terms of millets too, uh, India is making a significant contribution to food security. We are the largest producers of millets in the world, and good news is that we have achieved grain sufficiency. We are also one of the largest exporters of food grain today. The book, The Late Victorian Holocaust by Mike Davis has been a, the winner of the World History Association Book Award, and this presented a master account of what happened uh, in terms of climatic and colonial history. Of course, this book uh, provides a heart a heart wrenching picture of the food deprived Indians back then. As you can clearly see these famine struck Indians, clearly you can see that we we have uh, we are reaping bountiful harvests harvests today and food sufficiency compared to the times back then. Interestingly, the Green Revolution uh, helped us to overcome food deficiency. It led to an increased agricultural productivity because we adopted high yielding crop varieties of rice, wheat, sorghum, etc., which allowed us to boost our crop yields, addressing the rising food demand. In fact, India transformed from a food deficient to a self-sufficient nation, and we have contributed to a stable and a secure food supply for the growing population. In terms of food security, we uh, of course we have turned to be one of the largest net import. We are transformed from the largest importers of food grains to to today being a leading exporter of rice and.
respect to economic growth and there have been um, uh, there has been a tremendous economic growth and uh, technological advancements like the modern agricultural technologies including fertilizers pesticides and irrigation techniques which were adopted allowed us to enhance our agricultural productivity uh, various studies, experimental studies and IPCC reports confirm that the evolution of climate, especially uh, the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme events have affected agro ecosystems. While many species are becoming extinct because of rises in temperature, CO2, etc., the number of pests and pathogens are increasing. There are more wildfires, uh, soil salinity is increasing. Uh, there's more flooding, more drought, and there is heat stress on livestock and humans, which are necessitating resilient strategies to mitigate the impact on crop yields, water resources, and overall food production and agriculture. In 1913, Fritz Haber was awarded the Nobel Prize for developing methods for producing ammonia from uh, nitrogen uh, and uh, hydrogen, which aided the manufacturing of the artificial fertilizer. Of course, that was a boon, but today excess and protracted use of these chemicals is uh, causing widespread air, water, soil pollution, which is affecting not only humans, plants and animal health, but also uh, is leading to ecosystem degradation. In fact, over exploiting exploitation and depletion of natural resources such as the non-renewable soil, water and air highlight the urgency of adopting alternate suitable farming practices to prevent irreversible damage to the sole planet of life that we have. Uh, natural, organic, regenerative, zero budget, natural farming are all alternate um, and similar terms and they advocate chemical free and livestock based farming with their roots um, predominantly in agroecology. These similar methods, in fact, uh, uh, like you can see here, they uh, aim to have an uh, eco balance. They want to support um, diverse life forms. They introduce methods like mulching. They, uh, there is minimal soil disturbance, pest management uh, methods, use of indigenous crops, etc. all rooted, as you can see on the right, on principles of soil health, where we aim to minimize dis disturbance, but maximize uh, biodiversity, of course, uh, and also reduce uh, or mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they hold the promise of ecosystem renewal and increasing farmers' income and arresting the negative impacts of climate change. The natural farming methods are indigenous to India, uh, while in there are differences with respect to organic farming and uh, regenerative methods. And in fact, uh, while these methods, the natural farming methods are indigenous to India, we have the oldest texts highlight the principle of agroecology. But the question is, can these alternate traditional practices find relevance in today's modern world and increase the yield of crops without synthetic fertilizer. Uh, many reports uh, show that the excess use of herbicides, pesticides, and synthetic fertilizers have reduced or shifted bacterial abundance, reduced uh, soil health, etc. So in order to counter all these, there is an urgent need to identify these natural methods. As you can see on the right, uh, in natural farming, uh, principles and practices like beach amrita uh, wapsa, mulching, jeev amrita are advocated because they allow uh, the seed treatment using livestock uh, products like cow dung, urine and lime based formulation. Wapsa is a method where you allow um, activating and making abundant the number of earthworms which naturally allow water vapor condensation in soil. There's mulching, there is uh, the use of polycrops instead of uh, monocropping methods, and uh, the different mulches are produced with trees and crop biomass in order to conserve soil moisture, etc. Even with Jeev Amrita, there is Panchagavya, and these ensure soil fertility through use of uh, cow urine, undisturbed soil, pulses, etc. In these methods, the plants are protected by spring biological concoctions, which prevent plant pathogens, disease progression methods, such as intercropping, which have also shown to reduce weeds and improve soil quality and fertility. Uh, it has been shown that uh, using the natural me farming methods, there is an increase in biodiversity. As you can see here, there is uh, these are the uh, about, this is the number of nitrogen fixing bacteria in soil which have increased upon natural farming. 
as opposed to the recommended or conventional chemical based farming. Even with respect to phosphate solubilizing bacteria, it has been shown that natural farming methods uh, which advocate Jeev, Amrita, etc. have uh, shown to increase the uh, naturally occurring beneficial microorganisms. But as you can see on the right, while these results are highly encouraging and positive and highlight the positive benefits of natural farming, one has to bear in mind that even one gram of soil harbors millions of other microorganisms and of which uh, only about 90% re remain to uh, discovered. So in future, microorganisms with other functionalities like um, phosphorus solubilizing, potassium sulfate turnover, etc., and roles and other cycles other than nitrogen and carbon need to be assessed. At our center too, the Devacha Center of Climate Change, we work on food security crops. We are contributing uh, to advancing science, improving society, our environment, and uh, framing policy designs. We work on millets, which uh, represent uh, important food security crops. Our results are the first to sustainable solutions uh, to improve crop productivity, disease resistance, and betterment of soil health in the context of climate change. Uh, we are hopeful that our results would expand our knowledge of fundamental science and would be applied for, uh, would be beneficial for applied research. As you can see in collaboration with the University of Agricultural Sciences Bangalore and Zonal Agricultural Research Center in Mandia, we are carrying out field experiments using sustainable and cutting edge scientific methods to study climate resilient agriculture systems. We study the soil composition, microbiome, nutrients that affect crop yields with changing climate. Our study in future would test how climatic changes influence the dynamic uh, physiological processes of plant development and growth, yield and soil microbiome. We plan to understand how how microbial studies can regulate the plant microbe interactions in response to climate change, which can help to understand the larger interactions in ecosystems. As you can see, uh, our results showed uh, that wherever we had used the synthetic fertilizer treatment, the disease causing bacteria were higher in number. There were lower numbers of bacteria which are involved in beneficial soil activities, for example, the nutrient uptake. Uh, where uh, in fields where we had applied the beneficial microbial consortium treatment to study uh, the effects on yield, etc., we found that we had higher numbers of bacteria involved in um, enhancing soil nutrition, disease suppression, drought resistant, and the nutrient cycles. Um, we've also seen that wherever we had the bioinoculant treatment, they were uh, it was better than that of the control in many cases, uh, as you can see here. Uh, of course, the fertilizer treatment also gave uh, higher results, higher uh, changes with respect to the control and bioinoculants, highlighting that in future we need to make amendments to our um, uh, to our methods, and there is a scope for innovation in this in order to increase the yields without using synthetic fertilizer. As you can see here, our metagenomes result. Uh, our results have shown that the fertilizer treatment has resulted in a large shift in the bacterial species as opposed to the control uh, where you can see undisturbed soil samples or look almost like that where we have not added any fertilizer or where we have added bio inoculants. Clearly, there is a shift in these two highlighting that the bio inoculant treatment does not cause major shifts in bacterial diversity. Uh, even with respect to these experiments, we need long term experiments. Uh, we have been able to identify uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, not nutrient solubilizing bacteria. We've been uh, able to identify bacteria involved in drought tolerance where we've not added the synthetic fertilizer, highlighting again the scope for future innovations. We are also looking at uh, the rhizosphere microorganisms and finding which are these uh, which constantly interact with each other to perform multiple functions in soil, since majority of these still remain unknown. Uh, here in this um, in these graphs, I've selected a few crops from the study of uh, Ranjit Kumar et al. to show you that um, 
it was found that they uh, in states of Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, the uh, farmers uh, they've tested where farmers have used GM Amrita, Bij Amrita, etc. Along with the available farmyard manure, they've uh, resorted to natural farming with and without farmyard manure. They've resorted to conventional chemical farming, and it was found uh, while the average yield shown as X in the box plot for the non uh, natural farming is higher when compared to that of the natural farming without farmyard manure. It was found that when this na natural farming methods were augmented with the farmyard manure, it had higher yield than both um, NF, both um, NF without FYM and non NF. So clearly suggesting that the na these practices where you have improved natural farming methods, they can give better results than that of conventional farming. These results show that there is a tremendous scope of uh, innovation for improving the natural farming practices where we can perhaps in future add more bio inoculants or change certain methods in order to increase the crop productivity. If you see on the right, as far as the trend in the yield of major crops under natural farming in the last three years is concerned, it was shown that uh, the yield is more or less stable for the past three years for almost all the crops that were being tested. And here, according to the lifestyle assessment of natural farming and non-natural farming, a study in Andhra Pradesh showed that natural farming um, uh, has proved to uh, improve the soil moisture content, earthworm abundance, etc., as also seen in this study by Dadigin et al. They found that uh, in green, like you can see, the zero budget natural farming was uh, uh, the sample showed a higher moisture content, and even the uh, earthworm abundance uh, increased when the uh, food grains were treated. As far as the study by Ranji et al is concerned, they found that uh, there was um, improved water uptake with respect to uh, zero budget natural farming. As you can see here, these practices require lesser water than non natural farming methods, suggesting that uh, these uh, the natural farming has proved to improve the water retention capacity. It requires less water consumption and perhaps even electricity. So therefore, uh, this these are methods which uh, allow us to preserve groundwater, improve our water table and reduce the financial stress on the farmers. Uh, as you can see here in results of Dudigan et al, uh, the yield in terms of natural farming was higher in different uh, districts, uh, like for example in Anandpur, Kada, uh, Kadapa, Krishna, Nellore, etc. You can see that the yield of different crops was higher when it came to the natural farming methods, except uh, in case of Vishakapatnam, where uh, there was a slight, uh, there were decreases in the use of natural farming methods. Uh, also, in terms of radish, uh, the conventional method fared better, but nonetheless, in many regions, the natural farming methods have given better uh, yields. Again, highlighting that uh, there is con uh, there is a scope for improvement, and hence this remains a challenge as to how we can increase yields without synthetic fertilizer. In these studies, the authors have discussed that the zero budget natural farming has derived benefits from higher soil moisture content, lower uh, soil temperature and a larger number of earthworms due to mulch addition. And it would be interesting to see when such experiments are replicated for many crops across various agro um, uh, climatic conditions. According to the USDA, the National Agricultural Statistics and Service Surveys have shown that at least 79% um, increase in certified organic cropland acres have um, uh, been achieved, revealing the beneficial aspects of natural farming. Recently, there has been a lot of support from the government of India in promoting the national mission on natural farming and organic farming through the Paramparagat uh, Krishi Vikas Yojana and the Mission Organic Value Chain Development for Northeastern Region. Uh, the Bharatiya Prakritik Krishi Padditi is a submission under the Para, uh, Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana, and this also falls under the umbrella of the National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture. And therefore, this uh, shows that there is a need for more incentives and awareness that will increase the natural farming initiatives within our country. Of course, if you look at the world area under organic uh, farming, uh, Australia today practice has the highest amount of land under organic agriculture. If you look at India, we, are, we lag behind when it comes to natural farming and suggesting that there is a lot of scope for us to improve our methods and practices of natural farming. 
of course, uh, natural farming uh, requires a lot of hard work and labor, but all over the world, you can see that the global workforce employed in agriculture has uh, declined from 40% in, in 2000 to 27% in 2021. So there is a need to increase the workforce in agriculture, which has, which has seen this decline. There are many organizations which are building programs to build and build the capacity of farmers to manage soils in a sustainable and an eco-friendly manner. I found this uh, interesting from the study of Ranjit et al, where it was shown uh, they, were try they were trying to study the benefits perceived by farmers <clears throat> as opposed uh, uh, benefits perceived by the farmers which adopted national farming as opposed to those which did not adopt. It was the farmers which adopted these practices found that there was a reduced cost of cultivation, there was freedom from chemicals, that food tasted better and the product quality increased. Uh, they were able to uh, have better crops even during the drought. There was increased soil quality and there was no exposure to pesticides. However, it was interest it's very interesting to note that farmers who have not adopted natural farming said that uh, there was non-availability of ready-made jeeva amrita etc and many of these formulations that are very important for natural farming methods they also had a fear of poor yield which is why they did not adopt these methods um, natural farming involves a lot of uh, output from the indigenous cow and many of them did not have the indigenous cow which is what made them not adopt natural farming practices hence there needs to be a more engagement in farming uh, to, to ensure that more farmers can transition from a chemical free environment to a natural farming environment. But those farmers who have adopted uh, the natural farming methods have uh, tremendously benefited and these have been catalogued in the success stories of Niti Aayog. As you can see, there is an increase in income with minimal output input for natural farming. If you see with respect to there are these three farmers whose successes I've uh, placed here. If you look at the expenditure that they occurred uh, for chemical farming, it was 30,000. Their income became 65,000. But under national farming, if they have spent 20,000, their income was three lakhs. With the uh, same thing for another farmer whose expenditure had been 72,000 and his income was about one lakh odd with respect to chemical farming. When he adopted natural farming, his expenditure was 64,000 and he incurred a better income. Same with another farmer, clearly showing that the financial, uh, there is uh, a financial benefit to the farmer, there is better output and uh, there are many such success stories around the world to highlight the profitability of natural farming. But there are long term challenges ahead. Uh, the natural farming methods, they still need to uh, increase the soil and food content uh, and that would be important. We also need to increase the nutrient content under natural farming uh, in the soils. There are innovative and eco-friendly measures solicited for which are necessary to increase soil organic carbon to ensure that there is better soil fertility and uh, uh, health. There is a need to foster biodiversity and rejuvenate our ecosystems to be in harmony with nature. The challenges ahead also uh, lie in growing food, which has a higher nutrient content in order to fi fight undernourishment and malnourishment. As you can see, Asia has some of the most undernourished people in the world. So the challenges are there. As far as uh, the scope, for future research is concerned, there is a need to bridge on uh, bridging the gap between the on field practical knowledge with scientific experimentation and validation. So there is tremendous scope for advanced research and technology. There is scope for innovation. Uh, we need to involve remote sensing, climate advisory, interdisciplinary field research and practice. Uh, more of use of more local machinery, building and generating more uh, <clears throat> local machinery and technology for surface water allocation, collection, etc. There is a need for soil engineering, for soil remediation, etc. And uh, there is a need for better government support so that we can improve our yields while we have uh, good productivity at this stage in order to ensure that we are able to increase crop yields. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini, for this wonderful talk on natural farming and what are the advantages and also highlighting the role of microbes in farming practices. So we can maybe take one question now before we move on to the next speaker. And then if there are more questions, we can get back to it in the final Q&A session. 
If people have questions, people you can add it in the QA box. I don't see, I mean, the QA bubble is not bubble. working for me. Okay, uh, I'll ask a question. Ask a question. Rukini, Rukini. Uh, so yes. what so is, what uh, how, is how do you uh, uh, solve the issue of pesticides and in natural farming? Like, do you use pesticides? Yeah, there's an echo of the voice. <laughs> uh, I was just saying that, uh, how do you uh, get rid of pests in natural farming? Like, do you use pesticides or do you uh, do you continue with the uh, natural organic me methods? I can't hear you, Rohini. I think uh, I think yours is muted. Okay, okay. When it, when it, when it, when it comes to natural farming, uh, plant-based concoctions using medicinal plants like neem, etc., uh, even uh, the pongamia leaves, eucalyptus leaves, are known to erase a lot of pests. So there are formulations uh, which are plant-based, and these are sprayed to eradicate any pests or uh, pathogens which are anticipated during the season. Of course, there is a lot of need uh, to have measures, innovative measures for these plant-based concoctions because there is an increase in temperature and uh, newer pests are emerging. There has been a big gap in natural farming practices that there are many farmers who are not aware of the practices involved in producing these concoctions, in making these formulations which are plant-based, which are natural uh, for spraying. But definitely there is a lot of scope to um, understand which are the traditional methods and uh, what can be scientifically achieved with, with respect to medicinal plants, uh, which can themselves act as anti-pests or antibacterial, antiviral. And uh, of course, there is a need to look at biochemical methods to isolate such compounds in order to um, increase their concentration and efficacy to eradicate pests and pathogens. All right, thank you. Uh, we can move on to the next uh, presenter. Yeah, okay, sure. So our next speaker of the day is uh, Madhukar Swayambu. He's the research head at uh, Vaidex Region LLP. So Madhukar has been an IT communication network professional over two decades, and he's turned researcher come environmentalist from 2011. He's also an ecologist, inventor, entrepreneur, biodiversity conservationist, a TED speaker, and also recognized as the global top three author on water by Smart Water magazine. So he and his colleagues at the Vaidik region have developed various indigenous technology that they call the Kaunomics technology, which is what we'll be hearing today. And that's used for resurrection of uh, native ecology of wetlands and water bodies. And it has won numerous awards from the Ministry of uh, uh, the Jal Shakti, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and so on as the technology partner, water hero, and they've also received awards as the ESG Enabler Technology Award for 2023 and RC Mishra Nature Care Initiative Award. So he has spent a lot of time participating in a lot of lectures, training programs, and also conducted various workshops in multiple national and international institutes. So today their technology is being used for rejuvenating billions of liters of water spread over hundreds of acres across our country. So we are great to have you here, sir. And uh, you can start the talk, which is on economics technology, transforming industrial wastewater into agricultural gold. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dilipji. Thank you, Adishji. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rohini, for a wonderful presentation. Am I audible to everybody? And can you see my screen? Yes, we are you're audible. Yeah. And we can see your screen. OK. So uh, as you've already said the context, uh, let me just straight away jump into the presentation. Economics technology is what we have invented for, uh, as you said, resurrection of the native ecology. And uh, why is native ecology important? It's because there are two aspects of uh, 
agriculture or farming or animal animal husbandry or whatever we call it one is uh, what rohini ji has explained and what uh, mr adish also asked the question what happens to the pests and diseases and uh, all those things so uh, one approach that uh, rohini ji has explained is uh, working on insecticide pesticide we decide either it is uh, a chemical uh, production in the factories or it is a natural production like jeevamrit and uh, uh, ghan jeevamrit and agni astra and all that so these are two uh, different sources of making uh, a, a similar product which is uh, pesticide insecticide or weed side or fungi side or whatever we may call as a threat to the agriculture production there is like we have just recently recovered uh, from uh, the pandemic so there we thought that there were two different school of thoughts with, which were working uh, to fight the pandemic uh, one was to work on uh, medicines and vaccines and another was to work on boosting up the immunity right so one approach has already been covered by dr rohini and um, the other aspect is what we will talk about in terms of the economics technology for transforming the industrial wastewater into agriculture gold so let me just begin with the presentation here's a small uh, video of the project that we uh, had discussed into the brochure itself so this is a scenario wherein we have a 32 acre agriculture farm and uh, just the bank opposite this uh, setup that you could see across the road that was a rice mill and rice mill wastewater is so toxic that if you put it into a fertile land it will become infertile so from there uh, the uh, both sides of the road there were two drains one side the rice mill waste water was put in and uh, people had a problem uh, the, the villagers on the other side had a problem and this side if you actually look at it now this actually gives you the complete scenario this is the rice mill this is the cow shed and uh, then you have the farmland so the cow shed had a biogas plant and on one side of the drain uh, on one side of the road the drain was filled up with the uh, biogas uh, plant slurry on the other side the rice mill waste water was put in and just about 2 km uh, down the line there was a village and the villagers used to have a problem with both the waste that was put into the drains so they had a problem and they were looking at solution so what we told them is you put both these waste the the rice mill waste water as well as the biogas slurry you create a pond so this is the pond that you can see where in both the wastes were put in we treated this pond and this water was transformed into neuroimmuno booster for plants and animals the same water was used for drinking of uh, the cows in the cow shed and the same water was used for irrigation of the farmland so this actually turned the entire farm into a disease pest and weather resilient farm the the production was uh, gone up in both uh, the uh, the dairy as well as uh, the agriculture or the horticulture whatever you may call it because uh, some of them uh, was being used for uh, the vegetable farming and some of uh, the uh, part of the land was used for uh, Uh, bananas and uh, uh, your papita so that uh, actually increased their income many folds because the input was minimized there was uh, i mean except for irrigation there was nothing else required so i mean that's a case study but let me just explain how it happens and what exactly is the fate of the farmers today as we all know uh, the farmers are doing a protest uh, these days also and their demand is the msp that is the minimum support price right why it happens is uh, basically because the input cost is so high that if the minimum support price is not given they will uh, be incurring losses and uh, they will be uh, getting uh, quickly into the marginalized community and that is why there was a protest now what do you see in front of you is 
a real time project in Muradabad, wherein you see this was a complete barren dump yard. And from there, when it was transformed, you can see the greenery all across. So all those farms which were near the water body were also revived. So this was a water body on government records, but actually this was the condition before we intervened. And after uh, we restored the water body, you can see the greenery is all around, right? So how does it happen is what we're going to cover now. The challenges in the agri sector, whether it is agriculture, horticulture, aquaculture, animal is better, anything. The challenges remain the same. We are just fighting three problems, weather irregularities, disease attack and pest attack. So one approach is to fight disease by disease, pest by pest by making specific kind of medicines, which we call as insecticide, pesticide or weedicides or fungicides. The other is to focus on the basic immune system of the plants and the animal that we are farming. Right. Then is a big, big challenge, which we call as the weather irregularities. As you can see, the data from uh, UNFAO uh, and uh, from Beyond News that just the drought causes $37 billion losses to the farm sector. And um, the natural disasters, which is like uh, your flood uh, or, uh, I mean, irregular rains, that actually causes $3.8 trillion losses to the farm sector. If we look at closer to home in India, uh, the, the impact that agriculture sector creates is 1 lakh 20,500 crores just in the government subsidies to the farmer, which is which include the fertilizer subsidy, the farm credit, the crop insurance, the MSP subsidy and all that. Right. This is again the source is Ministry of Finance, Government of India. Right. Um, in in this uh, bottom right hand side, you can see the website link of Ministry of Finance. Now, why does this happen is basically because we are not addressing the problem. Uh, because we have not identified the root cause, right? The root cause is we have contaminated water, air, and soil. Every plant that we plant in the farmland or every um, uh, cow or buffalo or uh, uh, a chicken or poultry or a duck or fish that we farm for is going to take all the inputs from this planet to grow. And these input will come from soil, water, and air. All three of them are contaminated. Obviously, the immunity will be compromised. The crop, as we say, the plants will not be healthy. If they're not healthy, then obviously uh, the, the produce will be limited and there'll be an impact into the, uh, the financial aspect will obviously be there. So what we have done is we have found out uh, a way out and that way out is add fertilizers, uh, use insecticide, pesticide, weedicide. And when we are using so much of chemicals, that is actually killing the natural process of pollination because it will not just be the pest which will be repelled or which will be killed by the uh, insecticide and pesticide. That will also impact the ladybug beetle. That will also impact the bees and the butterflies who are supposed to do the pollination uh, for a better crop. Right. So the natural pollination process is halted and then we have to use a lot of hormones. Right. And when we are creating these kind of uh, artificial methodologies for crop production, obviously there is a compromise in the longevity uh, of the harvested crop in the nutrient content that Dr. Rohini was talking about. Uh, the nutrient content for, let's say, for example, when the PUSA Institute was in uh, created in 1915, uh, they did a nutrient check for uh, the palak uh, and the, the spinach crop. And they found that uh, it had about almost close to 70% of iron content, whereas the same was done 100 years later than 2015. And they found it was reduced to only 27%, right? So why does this happen is because we have changed the entire methodology of farming. Right. Uh, we all know that uh, the Green Revolution started in 1963. Before that, we were suffering 
of very heavy losses into the production and post green revolution the production has gone up but the nutrition has gone down so this is all uh, impact of the change uh, uh, in the methodology so this is what is the root cause i mean boiling down to the root cause it is soil water and air contamination now to restore we need to restore the soil water and air back to the condition uh, which is which we call as a healthy condition and we need to restore the ecosystem services from the natural resources so that we have a stronger crop whether it is uh, agriculture horticulture animal husbandry aquaculture anything when the native immunity of the organism is stronger obviously it is able to withstand the harsh conditions which has which is like disease and pest attack or the weather ir irregularities right so how it is to be done is basically the the core or the root is to restore the natural resources uh, the case study that we have shown is uh, where in it it was a case study for a sustainable agriculture wherein we used that industrial wastewater transformed it back into healthy water now healthy water has got certain uh, uh, properties which is like into a water body there is a aquatic food chain which is like single celled organism then plankton and then fishes and fish excreta is ammonia which is again neutralized or decomposed by the single celled organism so this is the aquatic food chain inside any healthy water body by default the the water will have a higher dissolved oxygen level and all the electrolytes will be balanced so when you are using this kind of a water for irrigation onto the crop it has to be done in a specific methodology like it has to be done only as a foliar spray not drenching or, or flooding uh, the farm uh, only a foliar spray sprinkling on the leaves the water is not supposed to be given into the roots and there is a specific timeline for doing this kind of an irrigation so when we do these practices we are actually supplying the nutrients in form of water to the plant and uh, the plant will uh, absorb this water um, and uh, the the entire uh, plant will grow healthy the soil ecology will be revived and the air pollution mitigation will happen through the natural water body right uh the borewell water that we have been using largely across uh, the agriculture and horticulture across the country is basically not supposed to be used uh, on the surface condition till the time it is not cured it is not um, accustomed or acclimatized to the surface condition so that is why wherever we have borewells we put that into the water body we cure that water we uh, we customize it or acclimatize it to the surface condition by adding sunlight to it and by adding certain herbs to it so that the wat water gets revitalized for uh, being used onto the surface conditions and that is how we focus on the plant or the animal immunity instead of working on the medication so when the immunity is strong it is able to defend itself and that is how you get a healthy crop and a higher yield and even when uh, you harvest the crop the longevity of the harvested crop is higher i mean uh, we have worked with uh, some of the tomato farmers where in the longevity of the harvested crop which used to be about 3 days earlier had gone to as long as about 15 to 20 days using this particular methodology right so that's how it happens and what we are working on is when when i say restoration of the ecosystem services from the natural resources what i basically essentially mean is if there is a water body in the farmland it ensures that air pollution mitigation is done water pollution mitigation is done flooding and drought is mitigated because if the surface water body is connected to the underground aquifer through the soil capillaries and the capillaries are filled with water they ensure that the drought condition do not happen 
right? Because uh, between the layers of soil, there are soil capillaries which are filled with water. So the soil moisture content is very well maintained. So drought condition do not happen. And during the monsoon, when there is heavy downpour through these soil capillaries only, the uh, the monsoon water which comes into the water body because water body is uh, having a slope because wa water body will attract all the water by the gravitational pull itself. So the water logging in the farm doesn't happen because there is a water body. And this water body will ensure that excess of water is actually going down and recharging the underground aquifer through the soil capillaries. So uh, if even if there is heavy downpour, the flooding will not happen. The, the top soil uh, erosion will not happen because all the water will come into the water body and water body will recharge the aquifer. Reverse of it will happen during peak of uh, summers when the evaporation rate is high. The underground aquifer will recharge the uh, surface water body and the water table will be very well maintained. So the flood and drought mitigation will happen naturally. Similarly, um, if we look into the biodiversity conservation, aquatic food chain or maintaining ambient temperature, all that is a function of the natural water body. And that is how it the entire farm if we have a water body inside the farm itself, it creates a microclimate within the farm that ensures the, the strength of all the organisms on that particular farm, whether it is um, animals or whether it is birds or um, aquatic organisms or uh, plants. So that's how what we create is a complete holistic solution wherein air pollution water pollution, soil ecology, groundwater, everything is maintained naturally. And as a result of this is every organism on the farm, because of this microclimate, goes healthy and the immune system is strengthened so that it can defend all the disease and pest attacks as well as it can withstand the weather irregularities. So what we end of the day achieve is basically disease, pest and weather resilient farms. So this is again from a real time site uh, where in the pretreatment was uh, you can see a complete dry land and post treatment is a restored uh, water body. And because the water body is restored, the greenery is back into the nearby farms also. So uh, here you have some of the transformation stories wherein this was the video which was already shown. Uh, we have done similar projects into tomatoes, then bitter gourd, the karela. Uh, we have uh, done it in chilies. So there are various uh, wonderful case studies uh, wherein we have worked along with the farmers and we have sorted uh, some of the key problems even to the extent that uh, there was one of uh, the farmer who was doing uh, uh, that uh, uh, gobi crop. Gobi is uh, your cauliflower. And uh, that five acre farm was completely, uh, uh, what do you call it, infested with a virus. And I'm, I'm sure because we already have uh, all the agriculture researchers here, you would be knowing that uh, the agriculture science does not have any solution to the virus. So the only way uh, they have to deal with it is they have to quarantine, they have to uproot, and then uh, they come up with a new uh, crop. But here, the even the virus infected crop was able to deliver the similar amount of yield uh, which a normal crop would have done. So doing such kind of experiment, uh, experiments actually costs a lot of money that we have uh, invested on our own and uh, we've got it tested uh, from the lab and uh, the, the farmers are really happy uh, with this kind of uh, approach because their input cost is almost uh, minimized because there is no need for any organic or inorganic fertilizer, insecticide, pesticide or uh, uh, weedy side. And the crop is robust enough. They get a good yield. 
the longevity of the harvested crop is also high. So ultimately, their profitability is high. And once the farmer is assured of the yield, then all these kind of uh, problems like MSP and uh, uh, higher MSP and uh, fertilizer subsidy, all these problems are gone. So you can see that uh, the 1,20,500 crores of X ticker can also be saved for uh, the country. So these are some of the awards that we have uh, earned over uh, last few years. Uh, we got the Water Hero Award from Jal Shakti Mantrale. Um, TED uh, gave us the award for Idea Was Spreading in 2020 when we gave the TED Talk. Um, then uh, Smart Water Magazine has uh, uh, awarded us as the global top uh, three authors. I mean, uh, right now we are number two uh, as per the September 23 results. And Sir, can you uh, please hurry up? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm done. OK, I'm done. Cool. Any questions? Anyone? Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. So I'm just looking at the chat for any questions, but I will just uh, have a query on follow up on what uh, Rohini had actually said in the previous talk. So. It's amazing to see a lot of these transformation work that you've been doing. So have you also been like tracking a lot of the microbial activity and carbon fluxes in these transformed places to sort of get an idea of how these natural ecosystems are actually functioning to get an idea of ecosystem services? See, basically the, the water bodies are conjunction point of soil, water and air, right? And these are the only three media in which microbes can survive. Right. So by that virtue, every water body actually gives you the biggest possible pool of the microbiota. So what we are working on is when when we say restoration of the ecosystem services from the water bodies or the wetlands, basically there is a ripple effect in air, soil, water and even the underground aquifer. Right. So as long as these ecosystem services are maintained, as, as I said, there is a microclimate created on the farm itself. And that is why you get all the plants, all the animals, all the birds in that particular farm in the most healthiest condition, right? So your expenditure in terms of your antibiotics or medicine or hormones or pesticide, insecticide, weedicide, everything is uh, subtracted. So there is no expenditure incurred on these things which is a regular practice in any farm practice today right right so that is how you get the result yeah thank you now what we have done is we have gone even one step ahead uh, by tying up with iit delhi uh, which is uh, going to conduct uh, a complete uh, assessment with a scientific uh, data capturing in terms of what is the amount of carbon pre-intervention in air, in water, in soil, and how much sequestration is happening, what was the right. emission earlier before the intervention, and what is the sequestration post-intervention. So that every water body that is created around the farm area in itself can generate its own revenue in form of the carbon credits in form of the sanitation, the water credit, emission credit. And once the biodiversity is restored, they can also earn out of the biodiversity credits. So that will be adding five new uh, revenue streams to every farmer who's got a water body in the farm land. So that's yet another uh, step that we are taking. Uh, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> it's just an initiation yeah. right now. That sounds very interesting, yes. So any other questions anywhere? I mean, I'm I'm not uh, looking at the chat section, so if there are any questions in the yeah. chat, you can just let me know. Yeah, I don't see anything yet. I'm just. So. Uh, I had a question. I, uh, yeah. You said that uh, you are able to transform water bodies, but what are the chemicals you use? Uh, any uh, like, how do you 
fight chemicals with do you fight it with other chemicals or uh, bacteria culture or something like that <laughs> no neither neither bacteria culture nor chemicals because you know every chemical reaction has got some or the other residue right and every organism has got its own place you know a lab grown bacteria when you when you put it into an existing ecosystem it will always be an invasive species so it will try to create a space for itself into the ecosystem and in the quest of creating a space for itself it will be killing some other organism right so anything any living organism intervening into an ecosystem will always be invasive species right so the best way out is uh, like i said we have seen it during the pandemic uh, the rivers have started becoming cleaner all newspapers reported that all tv channels reported that that air has started becoming cleaner so why was it happening because there is a self healing mechanism that existed we reduced our intervention and it came uh, within the capacity of healing itself right now what we are doing is we have increased that nutrient overload everywhere so whether it is air whether it is water whether it is soil we are consistently polluting it because our changed lifestyles right so one thing what we need to understand is there is a natural mechanism that exists now how do we utilize this existing mechanism to solve the problem right like i'll give you one layman's example uh water contamination is basically nutrient overload so if it is within the farm there is a water body all that runoff water from the agriculture farmland which will contain all the fertilizer insecticide pesticide everything which has got a very strong benzene kind of a ring that will come into the water body breaking of these bonds is a tough task that is why the water body will start to decay because there is a um, inherent holding capacity of water of how much solids can it hold right so once it is uh, beyond the holding capacity it is dropped down and it deposits into the bottom of the water tank as sludge now this sludge will choke the soil capillary so the water is captive between the layer of sludge and the top layer of fat oil and grease now this water is decaying it will spread foul smell it will spread uh, water and uh, vector borne diseases right now we all understand that there is a natural digestion capacity that exists so all we have to do is we have to develop our uh, strategy to support this natural system Uh, so that the contamination whatever has come in is decomposed and consumed in the ecosystem in the ecology and the cycle goes on why nature is the most sustainable phenomena on the planet is only because it is cyclic there is no concept of waste or wealth in nature right everything is cyclic as long as the cycle is on there will be no problem everything will be sustainable right so all this nutrient overload which has come from the runoff from the storm water from sewage from industrial effluent all that can be rearranged by nature for production of plankton because everything comes with a lot of nutrients right like we have phosphate we have sulfate we have nitrate uh, we have nitrite we have ammonia right now if you actually look at the agriculture practices what we use at fertilizers ammonia is all uh, nitrogen then we have phosphates and then we have npk uh, then we have potassium right so npk anyway is coming invariably in every wastewater inlet that we have to the water body whether it is runoff water storm water uh, domestic sewage treated or untreated or even the industrial effluent so these nutrient elements which are coming in wastewater can be rearranged for production of planktons as the plankton production goes up the fish population will go up if the fish population will go up the bird population outside will go up if the bird population will go up the bird dropping will ensure that the greenery on the surface is increasing which will cause the return of bees and butterflies which will ensure a better pollination so life will be exuberating around the water body naturally right now what we do is we study the water body we understand what kind of contamination is coming in what kind of biodiversity is there into the water body or not right and then we make a medicine which is 100% botanical extract 
the the medicinal plants that we have and that uh, dr roini was talking about uh, creating a crop of the medicinal plant or making a pesticide or an insecticide out of it we are using it as a medicine for water itself so that we give that uh, space to the nature to rearrange it the way they want right so the 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 entire medicine that we make is only herbal extract no chemicals used uh, no uh, lab grown organism used this is uh, the herbal extract which is in concentrated form it is shipped to the location where it is amalgamated with fresh water from the same agroclimatic zone and poured into the water body early morning at the time of sunrise now during the day when the sun is up photons are available this entire medicine is synthesized by the aqua ecology and the resurrection process starts so the entire treatment is divided into three phases phase 1 is resurrection phase 2 is restoration where the bottom sludge is completely decomposed and consumed in the ecology for production of planktons and phase number 3 is rejuvenation so that whatever inlet is coming in the water body's digestion capacity is uh, enhanced to the level to handle that amount of load on a regular basis so that's how the water body is restored and oh, the water body is healthy enough to actually resume the ecosystem services so that's how it happens okay so thank you so much you were <laughs> quite a mouthful of words you said <laughs> thank you thank you any other qu questions anywhere in the chat box or anywhere no i don't see any other question in the chat box okay. sure so i would love to work with uh, dr rohini in some of uh, her projects wherever they sh uh, she is doing the research and uh, maybe with with our technology and uh, her research maybe we can give a better solution to uh, the farming community so that they are more profitable and uh, they have to put in less amount of labors in, in in terms of making that jivamrit and gan jivamrit and agni astra and everything right I guess she's not there. So, if you get any uh, further queries, uh, because I guess all the participants are registered. So, if you get any further queries in mail, also you can just send it to me. Uh, I would love to answer everybody's query um, in in whatever be related or unrelated questions, uh, because till the time the queries are not answered, the actually messages. not delivered properly i mean the retention is very limited till the time the queries are not answered right yes. so thank you adish ji and thank you uh, dilip ji for giving me this platform and this opportunity and i yes. understand thank you sir thank you madhukar and uh, yeah uh, because it was started with uh, dr giri and dr bhava also used to teach there and i guess dr vikram sarabhai also used to teach there so i am really really honored to have this opportunity thank you yeah uh, thank you both speakers um, mr uh, rohini as well as madhukar sir for an interesting uh, seminar on agroecology and water bodies so i i'm sure this was really enlightening not just for us but the audience as well so i think with that uh, we will uh, close the meeting for today and adish do you have anything else to say or share uh no i am stopping the recording now yeah okay, sure yeah thank you thank you sir